Hi, welcome to the second day of Code Emotion Room. Did you enjoy the conference yesterday? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> the only one answer is yes. <laughs> okay, just a quick recap for today. Uh, you have your map, we have four area, maker, game dev, startup area, and don't forget what the, your favorite project. We also have the sponsor area. Then we are having three labs the IBM Bluemix Labs, the Firebase Labs, and the Maker Labs in the Maker area. So don't miss it. Then uh, at lunchtime, we are having the final competition of our contest code factor. You can attend uh, and it will be really amazing. And also the contest script war. So we have a lot of contests and a lot of labs as usual, and obviously a lot of interesting talks. We are having also labs for kids, Hackathon for kids and also for parents. And at the end of the day, as usually, the networking gear. Okay, before starting, I would like to introduce you, Barbara, who is here and who is the organizer of the Makers Fair Rome, as we are partner of the Makers Fair. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara, and thank you, Code Emotion, for, uh, thank you, Code Emotion, for inviting us as uh, sponsors and actually to be a very great partner of Maker Fair Rome since last year as well. Um, I'm here just to remind you what Maker Fair is. Maker Fair is the largest event dedicated to makers and the maker culture and the world. The European edition is held in Rome every year since a couple of years ago. This year we're going to host the third edition. It will be held, please save the date, in October between the 16th and the 18th of October. The date is there, so please put it in your calendar and your agenda. We'll be waiting for you all, of course. The call for Maker will be launched on April 15th, which means just a couple of weeks from now, so please be ready. If you want to make sure not to miss it, subscribe to the newsletter on the website. We don't spam you, of course, we promise, but we'll let you have all the information in advance. Uh, Maker Fair, as I said, is the largest European event. It's the official European event of Maker Fair. Last year, we had more than 600 makers uh, with their projects, and more than 90,000 people actually attended to visit the, the, the stands, to see the projects, and to entertain themselves as well. There were plenty of fun and, and games and workshops and conferences as well. So we really hope to see you all there. And uh, please, if you feel like there's someone you know that might be interested in uh, applying to the call for Maker, just let us know. Drop us an email, subscribe to the newsletter, or just you know, follow us on the social, like Facebook, Twitter, or whatever else. Thank you so much. Thank you again, and uh, enjoy your day. Please remember that there are companies here for recruiting, like Wind, Neomobile, and TT Data. So if you're looking for a new job, or if you're looking to change your job, don't forget to, take a, to go around the companies we have in our main area and in the corridors for the amazing job opportunities they can offer you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This day of code motion will be full of code, of course, and also full of emotion with our three astonished, three of a kind uh, keynote speakers, starting from Mr. Ballard from IBM. Applause, please. <laughs> Mr. Kevin Henney. <laughs> and a guy which whom we share the name, the birth date, but lucky him, not the brain, Professor Tannenbaum. Thank you so much for coming. It's a great honor and a pleasure to have you all three. And one last thing, Mr. Ballard lost his mobile, so please, if someone uh, found find it uh, around, uh, bring it to the, our info point. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. First emotion. So let me introduce you, Mr. Ballard. Please come on the stage. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Ballard, and I am with IBM. Uh, I have been with the company over 20 years. It is amazing to see that IBM as a company is really trying to look to the future. And part of that is really looking to the younger, more <laughs> capable crowd, to be honest. We have a great uh, vision, and I want to take just a couple of minutes and give you that vision. The difference in the market today is the fact that IBM recognizes that any company, anywhere, no matter how big or how small, can take advantage of their ideas. The advantage is you can take your idea, combine it with the great ideas of several other people, and create a production application in minutes and days. And that's really the advantage that our new cloud technology is trying to take advantage of. High growth companies are everywhere today, and they take advantage of this by using other people's concepts and tools for that. The thing that large companies like ours recognize right off the bat is that in order to do that, it requires disruption. And that means that any one of you in this room can create an application, any one of you can create a company, and all the companies that are represented here can do that very quickly with the tools and the cloud. Now, the, the positive to that is, is that all of you have now become individual companies. And at the same time, IBM has to partner with you to do that. So Blue Mix is the way that we enable all of you to take care of becoming your own company. And as developers, we have to give you those tools to do that. The scary part is, is that disruption can be by a huge company or by an individual programmer. And so that's the tools that we're trying to provide and the enablement that we're trying to communicate. The four main shifts that are happening today is the developers are no longer supporting the front office. You are the front office. You're the ones that come up with the concepts, you're the ones that come up with the ideas, and you present those ideas to the end users. The difference is, is that companies have to provide you with APIs. APIs allow you to have access to all the data that the larger companies have and all the information that's out on the cloud. Data drives disruption. We as users today have a completely different attitude about access to information, the combination of that information, and taking advantage of it quickly and efficiently. And cloud brings all this together for all of us. Now, as a developer, you have several choices today. You can pick your runtime, whether that's Node.js or Ruby, anything that you want to bring to the table. The advantage of using different types of containers, including Docker. Using Internet of Things, which everything today includes data and documentation for big data using any of the APIs that I mentioned around access to all kinds of information you can use to gather for your users, allows you to use the tooling and microservices to create whatever application you decide to invent. What this does is this allows a very quick application development, test, and deploy cycle. You no longer need hardware, you no longer need the details around capital. This becomes a very quick, innovative life cycle for a product. And in the end, you get to take advantage of all of these tools as they are ongoing, their evolution, their changes, to deploy quick updates to your applications out on the web. The reason that uh, ABIs are so powerful is because they take advantage of doing something that's useful to the users, takes advantage of giving you the data that you need to enable your applications, and hides the complexity. It takes advantage of a simple interface with good documentation and allows you to focus on the application itself instead of worrying about the data and the information around it. And most of all, these APIs are enabled, if they're done right, not only for internal company 
use, but also for external use. So many companies take advantage of this by hiding their data. But the companies that are really trying to embrace the cloud are opening up their doors and allowing for guarded information to be externally used so you get to take advantage of that. And combining these APIs is very powerful. It allows you to take whatever concept that you decide as a developer that you want to present to the user and take advantage of that data and bring it right to their interface, whether that's a mobile or a web application. Hmm, that's not good. These APIs can be anything from a payment to a location, identification, social engagements, identification of the user itself and reviews that they may want, the history of that user, travel and messaging. And it allows you to stack all of that together for whatever concept that you want to bring to the table, whether it's mobile or web. The difference that we try to bring to the table is the fact that you can use any of the different services that are out there and you don't have to deal with the infrastructure and the back-end services required to stand up your application and publicly produce it out to your users. I want to give you just a really quick example to, to give you the flavor of how much fun this can be. We partnered with a company that actually runs the Lucas Oil race boats. And one of the challenges that uh, Visual Eye, Virtual Eye was trying to take advantage of was bringing their fans closer and the commentators closer to the experience. And the way to do that is through taking advantage of all of the different devices and Internet of Things, the data within the race boat, the drivers, and actually the users themselves. To take advantage of this, we used a Bluemix application that allowed us to go out and create a new experience for watching race boat, rub boating. And the race boating experience has now become not only the opportunity for the race team to monitor everything that's going on with the boat itself, but also the drivers. Their breath, their heart rate, the amount of force that they're being imposed on them, all of those wonderful things then rolls up not only to the fans and the officials, but also helps the commentators to give a play-by-play -play of everything from the number of RPMs that the, the engines are running to the oil pressure. And it gives a new level of experience to the users that actually drives not only the experience, but also feedback by the fans that are taking advantage of this new environment. One last thing that I'd like to spend just a minute on is Watson. For any of you that are not familiar with Watson, it is IBM's technology around algorithms and cognitive learning. The advantage of this is that it really takes and enhances any application that you currently have. And the way it does that is through analyzing anything that's going on with your application, and these services, these SaaS services, are available within the Bluemix environment to bind to your application and take advantage of everything from question and answer, automatic response, through text-to-speech, user profiling, all of those details that a user doesn't necessarily think about but an application developer can take advantage of and it increases the customer's experience and gives you all these tools at your fingertips so you can focus on the application itself. So the real advantage of our cloud offering is to try and give you all the tools. And just like the uh, organizers mentioned, we are hiring. We're excited for new developers to come in and give us ideas. We're excited for you to go out and test drive, take the trials of Bluemix, pull in an application, write your own piece of code in whatever language you choose, and bind the services and see what it can do. And there's a sign-up desk outside for all of you to get uh, signed up to do it, and there's also going to be a lab a little later on today. Actually, at 1140, we're going to take advantage of that. And Julio, who's sitting in the audience, will be uh, driving that 
and we welcome all of you to stop by and see what Blue Mix can do. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Right, I need, to change this I need to change this photo one day. My wife loves it because she looks young. My kids hate it because they look young. <laughs> so, uh, let me think. Let's talk about books very, very briefly. Um, I've got my name on the cover of uh, a couple of these books. Um, all that says is that I'm interested in software architecture. I'm interested in how we create things, the structure of things. And I'm also interested in how we create things, the structure of things. It turns out that it's people that do this stuff. And if you do lots of small things together, you get fairly large things, but it's not always that easy. However, these are not the books I want to talk about this morning. Um, this is the book I want to talk about this morning. Um, this is uh, a book by um, Ernst Friedrich Schumacher, uh, who is an economist. And in the early 70s, uh, he wrote this little book, Small is Beautiful, which tried to look at the question of how we go about um, uh, thinking about economics and growth and relationships to people, rather than just treating everything as an artifact and capital. What is the relationship between the capital and the people and the resources that we used? In fact, a great deal of thought went into this. And although it's kind of interesting going back to this book, it's very much a product of its times. It feels very 1970s. Uh, and there's interesting things, because he obviously talks about the future. Uh, we live in the future, which is kind of cool. It's a shame we don't have the flying cars. I remember the flying cars. I was promised the flying cars. I was promised moon bases. As it is, I can now look at pictures of cats. Apparently, this is the, you know, a big win for, the, for society. But this idea, there are still, there's still some ideas in here where, that resonate very strongly. And I, I thought, oh, this is interesting. And then I noticed the subtitle, which, because of the sunshine, you can't quite see. Um, a study of economics, as if people mattered. So I thought, when I was putting this talk together, <coughs> small is beautiful. I want to talk about software. I want to talk about code bases. I want to talk about the problems that we have. We have become too comfortable with the idea that things get large. Just as economics, historically, has got comfortable with a particular growth model and a particular assumption about the consequences of that. So I want to talk about code as if people mattered. Now, because it's such a short keynote, I don't get to talk about much code. So that's, that's a shame. I'll have to kind of, you know, you just have to imagine it. Um, and a talk on code is as, e as if economics mattered, because a lot of the stuff that we do just does not make economic sense. Or more to the point, a lot of the stuff that we allow to happen without realizing it does not make a lot of sense. This book was responsible for helping trigger a, uh, a kind of a more considered view of development. And uh, this is a, a definition of sustainable development that grew out of the UN's uh, World Commission on Environment and Development. Uh, typically, it's known as the Brundtland Report, uh, for, uh, named after Gro Harlem Brundtland, um, uh, Prime Minister of Norway, who headed the commission. But it's a really good definition. And although we're going to put it to software use this morning, rather than putting it to um, uh, the vision of a sustainable agriculture or sustainable economics, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. All too often, we end up taking a shortcut because we're human. We live in the present. There is now, and there is the idea, I need to release that now. I need to put that in now. The first job I had after university, I worked for a small software company. And the code in this company 
was developed by the boss. This is a very typical kind of thing. It was him, his brother, and I think the dog was involved as well. <laughs> and they hacked out this code. And then they sold it. And they sold the software. They sold it to a client. And that's what made the company, and the company grew. I ended up having to work on that code base. And I remember my boss telling me, this is my first proper job, and I was working on this, and it took ages to go through the code base. Yeah, my boss didn't believe in such stupid aesthetic nonsense as, I don't know, indentation, for example. <laughs> you know, you pay for those spaces, right? <laughs> and I remember he said, it didn't take us this long to produce the first version of the system. And I remember the thought in my head, yes, I can tell. And that is a problem. That pulls things immediately into the present, but without a regard for what happens next. Where is version two? At the same time, we get the pendulum swings to the other extreme, which is where you get projects that are so worried about the future. What if this happens? Yeah, we should put in a framework for that. We don't have a framework for that. Let us make a framework for that. That's brilliant. And the future never arrives. It's always, when's that ready? Six months' time. Well, you said that six months ago. Yeah, I'm consistent. <laughs> okay, when people talk about constants, that's one of them. So we need this balancing act. And as Schumacher observes, for every activity, there is a certain appropriate scale. So he's not saying everything should be small. He's saying find the right scale. What is the scale of this problem? How do we work with this problem? And there's a beautiful quote um, from a friend of mine, Chris Oldwood, just a couple of weeks back. This observation, isn't a netbook screen a bit small? No, if the code doesn't fit on it, it's too complicated. What this speaks to is not a physical constraint of technology. It is a physical constraint of evolution. The reason that we modularize code, the reason that we partition it, the reason that we have paradigm wars and wars of practice and discuss practices, it turns out that the multi-core processor inside this laptop does not care about any of these things. It does not worry about coupling and cohesion in the way that we worry about it. It does not worry about the quality of inheritance hierarchies or the degree uh, to which your code has side effects. It really doesn't care. It dreams in pipelines and firmware and hyper-threading and multi-core. L1 and L2 and L3 caches, these are what it thinks about. This is not what you program. The reason we care about these things is because humans create software and we have bandwidth limitations. We're really good when things are together and we can fit them in our head. We are very, very good at that. We can think quickly, we can make connections, we can have insights. But the minute we start scattering things around, we lose that ability, we slow down, we start making more mistakes, we lose our insights. This is why we care about all this design stuff, is because it fits on the head. It's not to do with the size of your screen. It is actually to do with the bandwidth there. This is why we care about this stuff. And so I'd like to go back, back to a time before, back to, there, yes, there was a time, and the next speaker uh, wrote a classic book, uh, Operating Systems Design and Implementation. But even before that book existed in the 1980s, there was this gem. I put my kids' toy lightsabers by it and put it in black and white to give you a sense of the period, okay? <laughs> this book, it's written by John Lyons, um, the University of New South Wales, um, in the 1970s. He wanted to teach an operating systems course, but lacked a real operating system. And around this time, the source code for Unix 6th edition was made available for a variety of historical and economic reasons um, in terms of uh, 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 monopoly uh, issues with telephone companies, which is actually to our benefit. And this, he wrote this text that basically explained, here is a real operating system and here is how it works. And it was originally passed around, as you can see, by Samizdat. People would copy this. Now, I'm just looking around the room and I think I have to make a quick explanation. That's a photocopying machine. This is kind of like a scanner, but it's more sociable. Okay, you hang out with people while you're photocopying a book. You know, you, can't, you make conversation, you talk about things, you plan things. 
Oh, it's also quite expensive, but you know, it, I, I photocopied a couple of books. But there's something about this book. There's around 10,000 lines of source code in here. And you look at it and you think, well, this is very 1970s, this code. A little bit like Small is Beautiful. It has a feeling of its time. And you think, oh, maybe it's not as good as code these days. And then you pause for a moment and you think, 10,000 lines. You know, I've seen classes larger than 10,000 lines. And when I've asked people, what does this code do? You know, they never come back and say, oh, yeah, it's, it's got a full operating system's worth of functionality. Normally, it's, it takes stuff from a database. OK, so do you do anything with it? Yeah, we give it to that class over there. What does that do? It puts stuff back into the database. How big is that? Oh, it's another 10,000 lines of code. We clearly missed something. There is something profoundly elegant about this, and this is an observation that was made uh, also by uh, Richie and Thompson. There have always been fairly severe size constraints on the Unix operating system and its software. Given the partially antagonistic desires for reasonable efficiency and expressive power, the size constraint has encouraged not only economy, but a certain elegance of design. In other words, this is something that we know from the arts. Constraints are incredibly powerful. They are very creative. They cause creativity. You need something to push against. You need a boundary within which to work, and there you will find creativity. One of the things I do for uh, 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 pastime, apart from take, I have, a, I have some hobbies, and uh, I don't just take pictures of books. Uh, I'm getting very good at that, but I also write short fiction, very short fiction in some cases. And there is a style of fiction known as flash fiction, which is written to a word count. Sometimes it's 500 words, sometimes it's 100 words. You've got to get a whole story across in that. And that constraint is profound. You create stuff. There is nothing worse for a writer than to go to them and say, I want you to write me a story. OK, what's it about? I'm not going to tell you. How long do you want it to be? I'm not going to tell you. It's like going to an artist. Could you draw a picture? Yeah, sure. How do you want me to do it? I'm not going to tell you. What do you want it of? I'm not going to tell you. Do you want it big, small? Do you want it in charcoal, pencil, oil? Pe I'm not going to. Oh. Now, if you give them a real problem, say, I want a work of art that is no larger than this, and I want you to use your two favorite colors, and I want it in 30 minutes, now you have art. This is how we create things, by finding something to push against that pushes back. Is this economically sensible? Does this create great software? Here's uh, an interesting one. This is the top and tail of less than 200 lines of Perl, my least favorite programming language. But I'm going to acknowledge something very important about this. This is taken from 1995. This is Ward Cunningham's wiki. This is the original wiki. If you looked at the wiki, you'd go, well, that's a stupid idea. How could you ever create anything important out of that? And it turns out, profoundly simple. You start small, you grow. Hemingway notes this idea, you know, eschew the monumental, shun the epic. All the guys who can paint great big pictures can great, uh, paint great small ones. So this leads us to the question and the challenge. We suffer from an almost universal idolatry of giantism. We see this in a lot of enterprise software. It is therefore necessary to insist on the virtues of smallness where this applies. So what am I talking about here? Let's talk about FizzBuzz. Has anybody encountered the FizzBuzz Carter? Any show of hands? OK, FizzBuzz, it's a very simple idea. It's a very simple programming problem. It's summarized here. It's a game. It's originally a, pr a drinking game. You go around a group of friends. One, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven. If the number is divisible by three, you say fizz. If it's divisible by five, you say buzz. If it's divisible by both, you say fizz buzz. If you get it wrong, you have a drink. <laughs> okay? Apparently, it's also a kid's game, but I'm not quite sure what they drink. I don't think it can be as much fun. And this has become a very simple programming problem. But this, this is a work of art. This is a masterpiece. Somebody has created the fizz buzz enterprise edition. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just going to show you a small part of it. 
And this is the FizzBuzz Enterprise Edition. The part of the interface is the factories. There's a FizzBuzz Output Strategy Factory. There's a FizzBuzz Solution Strategy Factory. There's an integer printer factory. Don't forget the evenly divisible strategy factory and the output. This is just a fraction of the enterprise gorgeousness that we have here. In other words, we create large systems out of dysfunctional styles and dysfunctional practices that we do not question. How else do we get large systems? There's another cause of large systems. Oh, actually, I've forgotten this one. This is actually a beautiful observation from Paul Anderson. I've yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when you looked at it in the right way, did not become still more complicated. Use this at work, okay? Ob observe this. Now, the observation I want to make is one of structure. How do you make a system large? This is a still. These, these are really old pixels. In fact, they're so old, they weren't even pixels originally. It's taken from a paper uh, published in 1968, Datamation by Melvin Conway, uh, giving rise to this idea, Conway's Law, how do committees invent? His observation, which still holds, the basic thesis is that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. This doesn't mean it's an image of the org organizational chart. It is a copy of the communication paths, which ref is reflected in geography, organizational hierarchies, and other things. If you get 50 people to do a five-person job, you will get a 50-person system. You will not get 50 people creating a small system. It is not possible. So what happens is that many of the reasons systems become large is not just the design practices, the dysfunctionality of that. It is actually the way that they are staffed and managed and organized. I'll skip that slide. And, yeah. and there is a third point I would like to make as we kind of head into the conclusion. Third point, how do s what are the consequences of large systems and how do they become large? Again. Systems don't become large because people are stupid or evil. They become large because people are people and we have social structures. But we need to sometimes reflect on these. One of the most common problems that we have in any system that has been around for more than about five seconds is legacy code. The moment you hit the keystroke, it's legacy. Or the other way of looking at legacy is code somebody else wrote. That's the other definition. What is one of the most common characteristics? One of the most common characteristics is dead code. And people always say, oh, it's OK. You can just leave it in there. There's no harm. This is not a photograph I took. This is a stock photo from Getty Images of Knight Capital Group. Knight Capital Group, who managed on the 1st of August 2012 to lose $460 million in 45 minutes. I mean, that takes skill. I mean, that is the, that's what we mean by algorithmic trading. Yeah? Okay, have you ever wondered? It's, make, it's doing the wrong thing at high speed. <laughs> How did they do this? Well, there's this rather good piece by Doug Seven on, you know, he calls it a DevOps, a cautionary tale. The update to the SMARS system was intended to replace old, unused code, referred to as PowerPeg. Functionality that Knight hadn't used in eight years. Why code that had been dead for eight years was still present in the code base is still a mystery. No, it isn't a mystery. It's totally normal. It's, I mean, it's, it's a surprise to find code that's actually used. I mean, we're looking at it the wrong way. But that's not the point. Now, actually, it is the point, because events like this arise because of what, I, what we can refer to as a perfect storm. Catastrophes do not happen because of one thing. They happen because of a number of things that reinforce each other. Now, I cannot tell you how to eliminate this, otherwise I would not be here. I would be in a yacht in the Caribbean. <laughs> this is a non-trivial problem. If you solve it, you will be wealthy. But what I can do is I can try and insist that maybe we can reduce the probabilities of certain things. And so the consequence, first 45 minutes, bang, 212 parent orders, leads to a cascade of 4 million transactions, giving rise to an exchange of 400 million shares and it's the wrong shares. This is, so next time somebody says to you, oh, that's dead code, it doesn't, nobody does anything with that, just point them in this direction. So I'd like to close now with a, just a couple of considerations. First from the uh, American author, um, filmmaker, and political activist, Susan Sontag. Our task is not to find the maximum amount of content in a work of art. 
Think of this in terms of your code. Our task is to cut back content so that we can see the thing at all, so that we can actually understand and grasp and have insights about the thing at all. And so I coined this phrase a few years ago, but tweeted it again last year. We keep talking about incremental development. We don't talk enough about decremental development. On that, I will leave you with Schumacher's note. Thank you very much. It's a tough act to follow. Um, OK. Um, I've been in this business 40 years. And that's probably before most of you were born. And a lot has changed. And I want to sort of reflect back a little bit, maybe give you some perspective in the same way that Kevlin was talking about uh, things. Um, so here's the outline of my talk. I started about 40 years ago. And um, I want to talk about how things were 40 years ago and a little bit like how they might be in 40 years, OK? But with a little bit of luck, I'll be dead. So if I'm wrong, you can't get back to me. Um, first, uh, the past, OK? Um, past is prelude or whatever. Um, in 1971, sort of when I got going, um, the fastest computer in the world was the CDC 6600, which filled up a room much bigger than this, OK? So it was the fastest computer in the world. And everybody you know, thought it was great. We had one at Berkeley and where I was. And I want to compare the 6600 to the iPad, OK? Just to give you some idea of what's been going on. Um, there's the 6600. Uh, there's the iPad. But this is not the scale. <laughs> uh, um, so we're going to look at a number of different, uh, different items here, like speed. The 6600 had a 10 mega, an incredible 10 megahertz clock. It could run 100 micro. You had to program it very carefully to actually take advantage of that. But it could actually issue an instruction every 100 microseconds if you tried real hard. Um, the iPad Air has got two processors at 1,400 megahertz each. Okay. The memory of the CD6600 has a massive 2 megabyte memory. You know, it took up this much space to store the memory. The iPad Air has got a gigabyte in it. The um, disk space, this thing had a 60. A megabyte disk, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. <coughs> the iPad Air comes with 128 gigs if you get the big model. Um, the volume uh, it took up 800 cubic meters, which is a room <laughs> much bigger than this. <coughs> and the iPad Air, I worked out, was 0. 0.0004 uh, cubic meters. There's a factor of 2 million there. And the price converted to 2014 dollars. The 6600 cost. $40 million, and the iPad cost about $1,000 for the biggest model, <coughs> a factor of 40000 there. And if you multiply those things together, so in terms of price performance of what's happened in the last 40 years, that's a factor of 10 to the 19th, right? That's you know, one with 19 zeros. Um, that's a big difference, OK? Um, I'm, I'm going to get even with you guys and fight back. <laughs> um, OK, so 10, 10 to the 19th. 
Um, now, suppose the Boeing 707, which was you know, the aircraft of choice, biggest aircraft around 40 years ago, also had an improvement of 10 to the 19th in 40 years. Okay? So what would you know, the aircraft be like? Um, well, the speed um, would improve by that amount. You could fly from Rome to, say, San Francisco in three minutes. <laughs> That's the performance improvement. The memory is like capacity. You could put 100,000, the memory size, put 100,000 passengers on this plane. Um, the range is like, you know, how far can fly nonstop. You could fly around the Earth 500 times without refueling. Okay. Um, the volume, the plane would be the size of an iPad, <laughs> of an iPhone. And for the 100,000 passengers, this would be quite cramped. But the airlines don't care about that, actually. <laughs> Um, and the price of a ticket from Rome to San Francisco would be about one cent, okay? <laughs> this is what 10 to the 19th means. However, your baggage would still end up in Siberia, <laughs> and one in 50 flights would crash, you know, with or without the pilot trying, um, and the engineers would be proud of their safety record to boot. <laughs> That's the worst part of it, okay? Um, anyway, disks. The disk on the 6600 occupied, you know, it's like two, a washing machine and a dryer next to each other, maybe a little bit bigger. That was the size of the disk. And now, you know, two, two terabyte disks this big cost 100 euros. Um, it's just an enormous kind of uh, change we've seen. There's no other industry which has gone through anything like this. I think people miss that. Um, printing. Um, we had, a, 40 years, a daisy wheel printer. It was a, like a, sort of like an IBM Selectric typewriter, which you don't know what that is, but, but it was like a little ball. It had a wheel, a plastic wheel, and spun around. It was a hammer, and when the right character was in, well, they wanted to print, the hammer would come out and hit the little plastic you know, finger on it and press against the ribbon and make an impression. And one of the guys in our place wrote software, so you'd print a page in Roman characters, would go back to the top of the page and beep, you'd take the wheel out, put in the italics wheel, and it would jump around to print the italics characters, go back to the top of the page again and beep, and then you put in the math wheel and print all the math symbols, then go to the next page and beep, you put the Roman wheel back. That was how printing worked 40 years. This is the top of the line best printer that you could get 40 years ago. So it's really um, <coughs> amazing how much the things have changed. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the future a little bit, but with a couple of uh, footnotes here. Um, uh, the RAND Corporation, which is one of the U.S. government's big military think tanks, was actually envisioning uh, home computers back in 1954. And they thought they would look like this. Um, now, a couple of predictions, just to get you know, some idea of how predictions go. Uh, T.J. Watson, chairman of IBM, said there's a, a world market for maybe five computers back in 1945. Um, remote shopping will be a flop. That was in Time Magazine in 1968. I think Jeff Bezos would be quite surprised to hear nobody's interested in remote shopping. Um, Ken Olson of, uh, of DEC, which doesn't exist anymore, said, nobody needs a computer in their home. This is a PDP-11. Um, Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, said, I predict the internet will go spectacularly supernova and in 1996 will catastrophically collapse. And I'll eat my words if this is not true. By 1998, he sort of realized, hmm, problem here. So at a conference in 1998, he baked a very large cake, put his words on the icing of the cake, cut out a piece of the cake and ate it on stage. People sort of booed him for this. And so he had a backup plan where he had a blender and filled it with yogurt. And he took the words on very small things, cut them in tiny little strips, put it into the blender and stirred it around and drank a cup of the yogurt. But, uh, and Metcalf's a smart guy. So, you know, um, uh, Bill Gates, who some of you may have heard of, said in 2004, <laughs> spam will be solved in two years. If you can't read the caption, it says, I've got a message from somebody I know. Okay? Um, uh, Steve Ballmer, then uh, you know, CEO of Microsoft, said, there's no chance the iPhone will get any significant market share. You know, wouldn't surprise me if Tim Cook would say, there's no chance that Microsoft's phone will get any market share. But that was Ballmer. Um, and last, some of you may know uh, Werner Vinge, a famous science fiction author. He predicted that chips in the future would have on the chip, right on the chip itself, a CPU and memory right on the chip and I.O. and a piece of the chip reserved for the NSA 
so they could um, <laughs> capture the data at the source. <laughs> Save them the trouble of wiretapping things. Okay? So the conclusion is that making predictions is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> so um, you should take this with a grain of salt or perhaps a barrel of salt. Um, anyway, so some of my predictions. So I could, I could you know, take the easy path and just use Moore's law and you know, every 18 months, the number of transistors on a chip doubles, so it's you know, just easy to extrapolate that. Um, but I'm going to stick my neck out, actually, and say things that are not you know, Moore's law. Optical computing, OK? Um, using light instead of electrons for computing. Now, electrons you know, um, are, are negatively charged, and they repel each other whereas photons have no charge, and they can have very, very high densities. Furthermore, everything involving light uses 10 to the 14th somewhere, okay? So it's very, very high frequencies, and um, computer systems have storage and communication and computation as sort of the, the three main pieces. And in communication, we already have optical. You know, the whole phone system, except for the last mile, is fiber optics, uses dense wavelength division multiplexing, very, very high frequencies, and we're not even approaching anywhere near the capacity what fiber can do. 25,000 gigahertz is easy in fiber. You're not even pushing it then, OK? For storage, CD-ROMs, DVDs, Blu-rays, that's optical. Um, the new Blu-ray standard puts 100 gigabytes on a 120 millimeter disk. Um, so we've already got optical in storage. We've got optical in communication. And Intel has built a chip that uses laser light. And maybe we're going to get computing that's optical too. Who knows? So with electricity, if you have two wires that cross and you don't want them to touch, you've got to go up and over on the, on the die. And with light, you don't have to do that. They can just cross and there's no problem. So optical is interesting potential. Okay? Carbon nanotubes. Right now we use copper wires for everything. Um, imagine the tube made of a uh, single layer of carbon atoms. So the, you know, the, the, the structure, the, the wires, if you want, are carbon atoms forming a tube, which is empty. Right now, the electrons have to fight their way through the copper, because there's all these copper atoms in the way. And if you have a carbon nanotube, it will be empty. It can go through with much less uh, he heat uh, being generated and so on. So that's a possible technology that might happen. Biomolecular computers. Uh, these use DNA molecules and proteins to do computing. There's a lot of information in that. Um, you could grow your own computer in a test tube. Okay? It uses the, you know, the, the CTAG coding that DNA uses plus chemistry to do computing. And anything involving chemistry, as you know, is even better than 10 to the 14th. Everything involving chemistry involves 10 to the 23rd. That's a big number, right? You know, Avogadro's number. Um, these things are massively parallel. Um, people have using them for, for brute force searches of all kinds. Um, you know, people have actually already built storage devices that can store 600 terabytes per cubic millimeter. The problem with these things is reading them out takes a long time. But for archival storage, where you want to store it for a very long time, and you probably won't need it, you know, like a bank may be required by law to store all of its records for 30 years, um, but it doesn't need the records very often. If you can store 600 terabytes per cubic millimeter using DNA storage, it's an interesting possibility. Is this going to become commercial? I don't know but it's a technology people are working on. Quantum computing um, uses some of the properties of quantum mechanics. Um, it's based on things called qubits, which is a superposition of states with coefficients that are complex numbers. And by complex number, I don't mean things like, you know, 3.14159, you know, they mean like square root of minus one kind of complex numbers. Um, this is very complicated stuff, but people have made demos on a small scale of quantum computing. There's a thing called Shor's algorithm, which can factor numbers, big numbers quickly, which I'm sure all of you know would destroy all of e-commerce, because all of e-commerce is based on the fact you cannot factor big numbers easily, you know, RSA. Um, it might lead to intrusion-proof communication, because the Heidelberg principle, when you read a quantum system, it just changes its state. <laughs> so if A is trying to communicate with B and NSA reads it in the middle, it changes the state. When the guy gets it, it doesn't work, and he knows there's been intrusion there. So it's got all kinds of interesting uh, possibilities. 3D custom printing of just about everything is likely to become common. For example, musical instruments. People have already printed guitars that work, and you can play them. And you know, this is right now. They've already done this. Um, guns. People have printed plastic guns 
which are driving the airport security people crazy because they don't show up in the metal detectors, but they actually work. Okay, this has been done already. People have printed bicycles that you can actually ride. Okay, this is right now. Imagine, this is like the first five years. Imagine when this technology is 40 years old, people are going to be printing artificial parts for people and all kinds of stuff. So this is a very exciting and new technology that's coming down the road. Who knows where it's going to go? Ultra low power computing. You know, things are getting, using less and less power. Um, it's possible to put a thin film battery on the back of a, of a CPU chip, um, which can store 10 joules on it. That's enough computing power, enough energy, to run a 10 megahertz, one microwatt CPU for three years continuously. So it's low powered, but you can actually run a computer for three years based on having its own battery. So things could be self-powered with a battery built onto the back of the chip. Another interesting possibility is scavenging energy. That solar power puts out about 65 millimots per square um, centimeter. Some of you may have seen little calcul handheld calculators with a little solar cell that gets its energy from just ambient light. Um, you know, there's a smart dust project at Berkeley where they try to build a computer in one cubic millimeter. It didn't quite work, <coughs> but they came fairly close. And people will probably be able to build computers in one cubic millimeter in, in 40 years. Um, we can have edible computers then. If it's only one cubic millimeter, it's the size of a small pill. Imagine that, you know, you go to your doctor and, you know, you're sick and the doctor says, um, could you please eat this computer? And <laughs> goes down and, you know, it's sending back Bluetooth or NFC signals back to his computer and see what's down there. Um, we're not that far off, I think. Uh, ubiquitous computing, the idea of Mark Weiser, the Internet of Things, everything's going to have an RFID tag on it. And these things are like going to be a penny. They're not quite there yet, but they're going to be a penny. They're passive. They're powered by the reader, so they don't need um, a battery at all. They communicate by radio. And there's all kinds. Many, many of them have sensors, and they can uh, do all kinds of interesting things. Um, for example, all physical objects will be on the Internet. You can query physical objects from your computer. They'll be implanted. If they're one cent, they'll be gonna be, they're going to be in everything. Okay? Um, the European bank is going to put them in banknotes. So if they're uh, thinking somebody's involved in money laundering, they're not going to ask them where he's, where he's been. They're going to ask the money where it's been, and the money will answer. <coughs> um, it's going to be in, in clothes in your washing machine. So you put your clothes in a washing machine. It queries the clothes to find. There's all those knobs on a washing machine. You know, guys don't know this, but women know this. There's all those knobs you've got to set you know, to make the clothes be right. And you put your clothes in, all of a sudden you get a flashing light. Danger, danger. Red sock detected with white shirts. You know, <laughs> you know and you've got to go pick the red sock out because it knows what's in there. Okay? Um, medicine. So, you know, if a batch is defective, they can recall it even though it's been shipped, you know, far away years later. Pets, you know, already, like cats and dogs and other animals have RFID chips in them. Uh, people, pacemakers, diabetes monitoring, and so on, that's all going to, you know, sort of be possible. Dutch cows now have little tags on them, and the average cow transmits 200 megabytes per year per cow. That's now. Imagine what it's going to be like in 40 years that a cow's going to be putting out, you know, 50 gigabytes a year. Every time, you know, it belches, that's going to be, you know, 40 packets announcing, you know, what's going on. Um, balloon network. Some of you may not have heard of this yet. Google has a thing called Project Loon, okay? Um, they want to put helium balloons up at 20 kilometers, which is twice the height of commercial aircraft, like giant cell towers. And they envision a network of 100 balloons circling the Earth. And this will allow Internet access to about 4 billion people who don't have it now, because they're in rural areas and, you know, places where there's no cell network. And so this will, like, double the number of people, you know, on the Internet. And it's, these things are very cheap. A balloon doesn't cost anything, basically. And balloon can handle thousands of connections simultaneously. Depends on the electronics you put in it. But certainly, you know, many thousands simultaneously. And Google has made a business decision to partner with the, I, with the ISPs. They're not going to fight. They're not going to become an, an Internet provider. There's too many other problems with that. So they've decided to partner with the I, ISPs. So the ISPs won't hate them, but will love them. And they've asked the ISPs, do you want to buy time on our balloons? And everybody has said yes. Nobody has said no to them. So they're going to, you know, put a, I mean, it might not work, but I mean, they're planning to put up all these balloons, provide Internet access to the whole Earth, and have all the ISPs work with them and just buy time on their balloons. That will mean everybody on the Earth will be on the Internet now. That can have a huge impact. Okay? And they can pilot the balloons remotely. The way they do this is there are different winds at different heights. And by you know, throwing off a little ballast or changing you know, things in the balloon, they can make the balloon go up and down. So they can move it down, 
to a layer where the wind is going the way they want it. They've moved balloons, they've done this already, moved balloons 10,000 kilometers to the spot they wanted, plus or minus 500 meters. They can already do this, okay? So who knows where this technology is going? Some other developments that are of interest, um, small appliances like refrigerators that automatically reorder food when it's empty because they use RFID, smart houses, you know, that have all this, you know, stuff in the attic for controlling the heating and the air conditioning and whatnot. Um, smart factories, automated production lines. If you're interested in this on a small scale, go to mymuesli.com. You can order a custom muesli with about 40 different ingredients, and they give you a 16-digit number, <coughs> and you can tweet this to your friends. That was really good. And you get exactly the number of grams of oats and the number of grams of walnuts that you want. Custom production on everything. Smart cars. Um, it's rumored that Tesla is going to come out with a commercial smart car in the next few months. Okay, this is not the Google smart car. This is a commercial car. Um, uh, smart cities where everything is connected, and some applications. Um, you can imagine a personal assistant paradigm, all kinds of software, like home doctor. You know, my son has a red rash. What is it? And it you know, it tells you. Or home lawyer. You know, my neighbor's tree sticks out into my, into my yard. Can I legally take all the pears? You know, and it, it you know, gives you an answer on that. Um, most routine jobs are going to be automated. Uh, you can imagine social shopping. You know, you go to a store, and you try on a shirt, and all the cameras photograph you, and they automatically change the color of the shirt to all different colors. It sends it out to all your friends. Your friends vote on it, and you know what color the shirt to buy because your friends have voted blue is the best color for you. Um, Real-time automated language translation, uh, hearing for the deaf and vision for the blind, uh, you know, hacking the brain, embedded sensors that can read your mind. Who knows about this stuff? I'm giving another talk this afternoon, N not as nice, more technical, nevertheless. That's it. Thank you. Mm.